Welcome to Cookies, Cookies, the basketball podcast. I'm Ben Dietrich. It's no longer the playoffs, so expect our performance to decline precipitously this episode and going forward. Jordan Rodelli, as usual, is here. Yep, out of shape. Already put on my 15 pounds, my summer weight. No, it's 15 pounds of muscle and adding a corner three. Oh, yeah, but that's what happens... As summer league approaches. What's it called? Training camp. Put on 15 pounds of carb on carb and lost my mid range jumper. Andrew Quo, also here. Vegas League. I'm gambling, betting, eating buffets. Uh, I'm in my Vegas League form, baby. Got that baby out of the way early. Always been, I just on, started always new- been on black. <laughs> um, feeling good. How you guys feeling? Oh, yo. You missed the last episode. I, I, lis- I listened to you guys. Uh, in what country? I was in Italy. Went on a little week and a half jaunt. It was nice. In southern Italy and then down to Sicily for a few days. A lot of driving through bucolic vineyards with olive trees. I think they're olive trees. They grow some sort of stone fruit or something. Um, yeah, it was cool. I ate pasta with every meal. It was very, very carb heavy. And I listened. What's the difference between Italian pasta and American pasta? A lot of it there was homemade. Yeah. Like a lot of it. Yeah, at the restaurants, it was generally fresh. But in Puglia, which is in southern Spain, in the southeastern side, it's a very deserty and farmland and impoverished area. It's like the same food at every single spot, wherever you go. It's like Oracetti. And broccoli rob, or fava beans and wilted chicken. So it's like Williamsburg. Yeah, except instead of Brussels sprouts, it's fava beans. Our friends own an Italian restaurant in New York, and uh, it's northern Italian, and they won't serve any red sauce, which is like surprising for somebody like me who goes to an Italian restaurant that sells pasta and expects red sauce options. And like, we don't do that here. There weren't a ton of red sauce options there either. And when they did use tomatoes, typically cherry tomatoes. Oh, yes. Sweet old cherry tomatoes. Uh, the unsung tomato of the... See, I don't like red sauce, but I don't like ketchup either. That's fair. Are like, those, are they all, what's it called? Nightshade fruit? I feel like that. Like night, plants, nightshade, peppers, nightshade? mushrooms. Yeah, a while ago, there were people trying to, claim that they were bad for you, but they're certainly not bad for you. They might be good for you. It's like eggs. No one can figure them out. Are they good for you? I don't know. Are they bad for you? Jordan, Probably. Maybe. What do you think? About nightshades? Just eggs, nightshades. Oh, I don't like... You say eggs or eggplants? Both. I don't like eggs. I'm anti-egg. I grew out of eggs. Now I can't stand the sight, smell, or sound of them. <laughs> the sound of an egg. Yes. <laughs> what does an egg sound like? A light, delicate crack? Well, it depends. A light, delicate crack, or it could be a, a, a little slight sizzle. Mm. Um, but yeah, eggs are disgusting. That might be the most disgusting food to listen to someone eat. Eggs. There's no crunch involved, unless you fry a crispy egg, I guess. Or you could just keep the shell on if you're going to be wanting some crunch. What about eggplants, which to listeners, in case you're confused, the egg and the eggplant are very different. <laughs> they are. One's a nightshade, the other one isn't. <laughs> one, one, is, one is a tree and the other one is the fruit that the tree bears, correct? <laughs> yeah, the eggs grow on the eggplant. Yeah, cool. Glad we got that. A bit of horticultural information out to our loyal listeners. So we were Andrew and I had a thoroughly great time without you. Uh, Fantastic last week. Um, but you, how did you watch the goddamn finals? If you were traipsing around rustic uh, Italy in your desert with your egg pastas, <laughs> um, Just drawing pasta on your shoulders. 
flying scop, scop, off your scop, kicking scorpions off your hokas while you just slurp down some spaghetti. There were some geckos. They were very tough to catch. What are you trying to catch geckos for? I guess that's the first thing you do when you see a gecko, right? You try to get it. Yeah, I wasn't like going wholesale, like setting traps and snares for the said geckos. It was more like, oh, look, it's a gecko, and you kind of try to get close to it, and it just runs off. Can you feed a gecko pasta? Every, everything there eats pasta. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the indigenous gecko uh, pasta gecko. <laughs> what, 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 is, what, is the, what is the um, What is the physique of... The, the, the townsfolk in these small neighborhoods. It's interesting you ask, because a lot of these ancient cities and um, these places that you stay in that are old farmhouses that have been turned into hotels or like bed and breakfast, they're called uh, masserias, I believe they're called. The pronunciation might be incorrect there. But the Goes doorways, to Italy and doesn't learn a goddamn thing. Masseria, like a pizzeria. <laughs> but um, with the Masseria. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, the, the doorways are really, really low. Like, very low. That's good for me. Oh, you'd be a king there. A, a, an, a man with an eye amongst the. A oh, here comes the, the Asian pasta. Yeah, you'd, king. Be the, you'd be the king who can successfully walk through the doors without crouching. I don't know. The tall wise, yes. Wide wise, I don't know. After all that delicious orchieta. But, but. I was like, well, I guess they were medieval people 400 years ago. They didn't have the same, you know. No 3ND guys in the middle of the time. They didn't have the same nutrition. No wingspan? I was thinking like, oh, imagine how much they've, you know, people are taller today in general. And I think that's true. But then you look around and I'm like. It's definitely historically and scientifically true. Right. Yeah. But the people were there were all still like eight inches shorter than me. (laughs) Like they're also very small. So pasta stunts your growth? I don't know if it's a carb on carb thing or what, but they are a, a they the southern Italian is like about like five foot seven, five foot eight. Or or dangerously close to an anti vaxxer debate. Does it have to do with like fluoride and like uh, hormones and meat and stuff? Possibly. For generations. Possibly. Endless possibilities. <laughs> so well, anyway, it's I take us a while to get going here now that Oh, I'm going. I feel great. I'm just <laughs> draining those threes, man. Well, I listened to you guys on uh, Cookies uh, 147 uh, while I was making an eight-hour drive. And there were times when I stopped the tape to like get my own takeoff when you guys were fumbling the bag. And I'm sure your traveling companion was very excited yeah, about Yeah, she that. loved that shit. That's cool. Very cool. I'm just like, hold on. No, but the thing that Jordan's... Mis- no, 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 quo. That is They should absolutely- stay on the boomer thing for <laughs> longer because... <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, I watched uh, the games at like four in the morning on my phone. And? It's kind of weird to set an alarm to like wake up and then like watch the finals and then immediately turn it off and try to get to bed at like 5.30. So you didn't wait to watch them because you knew that your, all your alerts would be going off and you'd find out everything... I mean, I watched them in real time. It was just at 4.30 a.m. Where were you when the world ended, Ben? Sicily. <laughs> the massive bowl of pasta. Watching your take, your incredible prediction for the Raptors to win an NBA Finals come to fruition. And Against seething, the Warriors. Just seething the fact that I would have to watch you gloat. First we had LL Cool J with the goat. Now we have Jordan Rodelli with the gloat. Hey man, don't hate me because you ain't me. The Gastrodom- I, I don't. Gastro- <laughs> Gastrodomus. Oh, I love Gastrodomus. But Jordan did pick this and you deserve a victory lap. Well, it was an educated guess. As When did you make it? I think it was like September, October last year. So before was, was, the Gasol trade, before, before everything. And that, that's the thing. It was before the Gasol trade was when... Philly still looked as shit as they did last year. Well, not last year, the year before. Uh, And I just thought Kawhi was going to make a big impact. And I thought that that Raptors team is going to sound bad. It was more the subtraction of DeRozan than the addition of Leonard that gave me that strong feeling. And I just thought the Warriors might be toast. Um, Why? Just uh, so much mileage on them. Bottom, 
I just felt like it was ripe for someone else to take it. But then, of course, Sixers go out and get Tobias and Jimmy. And I was like, well, there's, there's my take in the dustbin. And the raps respond with a little... And then they got Jeremy Lin. A little Lynn, big Spain like, trickery, yeah. The take is back. I think I predicted Toronto to win the East because I did not foresee Milwaukee being as good as they ended up being. Oh, no, not at all. And then at that time, as you're saying, Philly hadn't made any moves, and I didn't really believe in Boston that much. But it was really what you said. You're taking away a decent player, solid player, and DeRozan. He's good. And replacing him with a top five guy that if he was healthy, that team was going to be gnarly. And lo and behold. Well, I believe my, my take was that it was Kawhi was going to win MVP. The Raptors would win... Uh, win the championship, he would win finals MVP and then leave. And he'd be like the first person to receive those amounts of single season accolades and accomplishments and then bounce. Okay, where's he going? Well, no, no, no. Well, I was just going to say. Come on, get... I bet, I bet if he... Finish, if he, finish if your he had, breakfast, if he, had, if he had played enough games to be sort of, you know, uh, ambiently eligible for that MVP, he may have won it, but they may not have won the title. That's true. This is all possible. I had a friend text me this morning, that if you don't win the championship, your season's a failure. The League of Losers. Everyone loses. Yeah. But to the opposite end of that, everyone wins because a few moves, like uh, you add a point guard to a certain team in Philadelphia, uh, Durant doesn't get hurt, they both win championships. I mean, the Sixers are obviously kind of the champions. It's funny how Ben Simmons has a championship and Kevin Durant has zero. It's awkward. What happens? How about this? What if you don't play in the in the championship? Do you Jeremy still Lin have played. a do you still have a championship? Of course you do. Greg Monroe got that ring despite Actually, he earned that ring for of Toronto. Of course he did, man. They all earned this all these rings. But Greg Monroe really earned it. <laughs> yes, he did. More more than most. <laughs> yeah, you get that championship. Also, uh, look at Greg Monroe, dominator of the Eastern Conference. Celtics check. Bucks check. Sixers, check. Is he just Raptors, the, check. That winning culture. Is he just an awesome dude? I mean, I can't tell. He might be cool. He said no to the Knicks, so he's probably a little bit cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That might be the coolest thing he's ever done. They're like, we're going to have a gyro in this place called Hudson Yards in two years, <laughs> and you're going to be the first one to have one of these wraps. And he's like, no, thank you. I'm taking my talents to Toronto at the time. No, Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Uh, are you talking about the Euro? Euro. Euro. The Euro step. Yeah. It's a wrap. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Let's get this. Let's, let's pull in the reins here a little bit. You know, do you guys have a satisfying take from this finals, or is it just sort of a hollow ending to the season? What's, are you, what do we take away from the fact that the Raptors beat the brakes off the Warriors? In a series that also could have kind of gone five games or they could have lost. I'm grateful for Jordan because I was rooting for his take. So that was the most fun. But yeah, it was a really deflating finals, if not for that. Like, the two really great players that were going to enter free agency get very hurt. And uh, the, the Raptors don't play well, but still narrowly beat one player. And Steph Curry trying to will his team to a win, like it's just, it was just really unsatisfying. Prior to the finals, I thought I'd figured out my my angles. One, of course, was that if KD returned and Golden State won, it would be yet another um, worthless, unearned finals. For you, you were trying to cancel everything. Yeah, I was going to cancel them. <laughs> if he didn't return and they lost, then I could cancel the Warriors team that beat the Cavs. And then if they lost two games and KD came back and they lost, I don't know. I was just going to cancel everybody. It, but this it one. Backfired. The, Nothing I, got canceled. I, I Everything got better. I couldn't do anything with this. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. Curry missed the shot, but he was kind of great. And his team was outmanned. And then Clay, Ends who was being, a bum, yeah. but had a really good half before he faked an injury. <laughs> <laughs> no, pooped KD his went down, then real. heroically came back, and then went down for never. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, I'm, See, look, but that's what I enjoyed about it. I kind of like everybody better now. I, I yeah, yeah, I enjoyed the drama. It was great. Oh, it was dramatic. great drama. It was 
you know, same thing. People text me like, who you got in this game? I'm like, fuck if I know, dude. Are you kidding me? Like, it could go any which Coin way. Flip. And then, of course, there's two games where it did, they did go different ways because of, like, savage, savage injuries. And you don't normally see that in a finals. Like, I, I can't remember any time where someone's been, like, like, the best players have just been removed from a championship round due to injury. Um, yeah, it was an extremely interesting finals. Yeah. And the weird thing is, the finals itself was far more interesting than the Raptors kind of handily beating Golden State. Just in the fact that it went six games, three of them weren't that close by the final score. But we're taking They the won res- that one game when Durant came back. We're doing then, the results thing with that, right? Of course, of course. But that's what I'm saying. The finals was far more interesting and enjoyable and weird and had all this shifting terrain because of what Jordan was just describing than the end result, which was like the Raptors kind of cruising in a way to a finals. I mean, the opposite of that. I mean, uh, we're looking at this thing as uh, interesting, which I thought it was. I mean, we love basketball. But like... um, it, we're just looking at the results being like, oh, that was fascinating. That's better than a blowout. I'm like, are we sure? Because all we took away was Kawhi's good. He's amazing. He's not hurt, and two other guys are hurt. Like, that's not super fun, but fun enough. Like, oh, I, I agree. I'm just saying a lot happened. Yeah. And obviously, with those two going down, it was, it was really heartbreaking, especially... I think for some reason the clay one really got to me because he was balling out. Like, he wasn't playing injured. Like, the, the drama was kind of like, well, you guys really fucking pushed the envelope on that one. With clay, it was just like, oh, God damn, you're about to have oh. one of the games of your career and, like, you land funny. Yeah. And we saw him in that first half yeah. with that elite defense. He had held Lowry to 20 points and five assists. I wish we had a. Uh, <laughs> I wish that we had a more fiery debate last time about uh, what the Warriors did with. KD, um, and, you want to you want to relitigate? I just think that we can't blame the team at all, and I, uh, weeks have gone by, or a week has gone by, and I still feel that way. Like I think Bob Myers has every right to be like, uh, you know, we tried our best. He wanted to come back. The worst thing happened, and everyone getting on the team for putting him out there, I think, is just. Uh, it's too easy for me. To me, we don't really know, at least I, I'm not sure, of the information that KD had. Yeah. Is there a potential accusation that the Warriors gave him poor information? And then is it a, a question of, did he make the decision to play based on something that was not accurate or that was biased or slanted in right. the Warriors' direction? But in terms of him playing, yeah, man, he's a grown yeah. man. Yeah. He's, he's an adult. Like, he's 31 yeah, um, years old, whatever. I, I get that, but I always wonder if it's, like, Steve Kerr is like, hey, Kevin, you just do whatever you feel comfortable with. Or if he's like, I don't think you should play. You know what I mean? Like, if there's people there that didn't think he should play, and I guarantee you there was many people that didn't think he should play. All, if, that, all that it was worth the risk. But that's, a, yeah, I mean, that's a more mild take, and I'm with that. Like, I'm, I'm a sh- mild kind of guy. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I'm not going to, um, like, I wish the, the debate was more heated, but it's, it feels so long ago now. But um, even if uh, the Warriors organization was like, can you do it because we really need you? And I'm like, they're allowed to say that. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, that's okay. And Durant was probably like, I can do it, guys. And the doctors are like, we think he can do it. Also, these are just the, these are odds, right? If you say, okay, look, there's like a three in 10 chance that you're going to blow your Achilles out. Do you want to play? You pick that he's 30% probably like, that's going to drive people nuts. Right. He's probably like, oh, that's a huge probability. Uh, th- three in 10, I blow out the Achilles. All right. So seven in 10, we win an NBA title. Yeah, man. Uh, what about like, there's like a one in 15, you blow it out. I don't know, like, we just don't know what the odds were. If he plays, he does well, he doesn't re-injure it, and they come back well, he and win even, it. He, like, was, he didn't re-injure his Achilles. That wasn't an injury to begin with. It was a calf. Well, I, I believe it was a calf, just because that's the only thing we heard. And, and we can doubt that. And I do believe that it was related to his Achilles rupture. Yes. That's kind of what I mean. It's like okay. the, the, his, his right leg. Right. Lower. Messed up. That, ooh, that right replay leg. is so ooh. gnarly. 
The um, it's really sad with those injuries, and but I, I this, this is going to sound like insensitive because it's it's me, um, but if we were to take a silver lining from this, is that it's completely obliterated the status quo of the NBA off season of what is it 2019? Yeah. One other quick thing I just wanted to say because oh, one other quick thing. No, no, your your point is is accurate, and that's a hundred percent true. But the one thing I just wanted to say about KD that I was thinking while I was riding around in the car listening to you guys talk about it, or Kieta flying out of your mouth, <laughs> just in a heat, just, just like he's just sitting there like slurping. Damn up. this level playing field, just pasta. No, it was Buckley that. Rob s- running back segways to talk about pasta. That happened. It's like, no, no, quo. No, not, not more about the Vegas. Come a- on. Italian ladies' aprons flying off with your takes. Just old women brushing dirt in my path. <laughs> so the thing about the Achilles injury, and we noticed it with Boogie, of course, in the finals, is that we kind of collectively know what it does to a player. And we already almost speak about Boogie in a past tense, right? We don't expect him to ever be the guy that he was. And that was all I could shake. I couldn't shake that thinking about KD. That what if we never see the KD that we have ever again? I don't think there's much of a what if about it. Right, of course. I'm trying to be optimistic. But in that situation where we've seen the best that KD will ever be. and He's also 30 and on his decline, debatably. But he was one of the greatest players of all time. And I, I hate to speak of him in past tense, but I'm using it right now. He was the best player in the NBA when he wasn't hurt. Unbelie- this unbelievable talent. And I'm kind of torn because Ooh. on one hand, no pun intended, seriously. I'm kind of popped, no pun intended. Jesus Christ, girl. <laughs> Danny Ainge is a dead. <laughs> Ainge dead. I mean, he, he might as well be. Trust Terrible. the procedure, Trust Johnny. the procedure. <laughs> Everyone. But I'm like, on one hand, it would have been cool to see Katie's greatest years that we saw him, this timeless talent, run, running a team like OKC and taking to the finals and winning a championship and, and like kind of reaching the heights of that. On the other hand, if we can, I'm kind of like, well, it's kind of cool he got a couple bullshit ass rings because he is like one of the best of all time. <laughs> I'm kind of like much more sympathetic to him winning those rings with Golden State, because I'm like, what if we don't get that guy again? Well, there's a lot to unpack with your takes. First of all... When How you... correct they all are is <laughs> where we'll start. Um, your attempt to cancel KD's rings backfired because it turns out the you've been claiming the Rockets could beat them anyway, but it, the Rockets didn't. Yeah, it turns out, yeah. It, it turns out they needed KD to actually push him over the top, and without him... They were in trouble with him. The Rockets could still beat him. So those were legitimate yeah. championships in my mind. Yeah, it turns out that it was the Warriors hitching their wagon to because you can train. Right, I'm you, fine with that take as well. One and two in the finals. Fuck out of here, with you. <laughs> Dynasty. One and two. I mean, no one's one saying Dynasty two? anymore. So did so in, in this way. Like KD's not really lost the finals. KD has six champion. He's six for six in finals. Uh, whereas Ben Simmons is only uh, one for two. Which All is I'm sad. saying is, I don't know how I feel about this because if this is the best we ever saw of KD, one of the greatest of all time, maybe the well, second I, best player of all time. I don't think we can time, say that though. Then, like, I'm kind of glad he got a couple of rings. That's yeah, all I'm saying. And it kind of sucks. I know a lot of people are like, well, he's going to be fine because he's not. He's he's more lithe and he's a perimeter player, and he will just like rise up over people. I'll just stick him in the corner. I'm like, yeah, but that's not what he is. He's a he's like kind of a slasher in his lateral movement. How he crosses people up to get into the cup, like chances of that coming back at that yeah. capacity as a thirty-two-year-old man coming off an injury like that are diminished, and that's what kind of what made him exciting is like, oh, he can do yeah. anything. And another thing about the Achilles injury is that statistically, it doesn't necessarily take away from your leaping ability, but it does hurt your jumper. Yes, and it just, does. Just their mechanics by math, it's like yeah. you don't shoot the same way that you've ever shot. Yeah. You, you might not get the same elevation. It just your body is different. And, and I hate to and do that's statistically something that's right. been kind of frequent when you look at Wesley Matthews or Kobe Bryant, about, whoever. Yeah, guys just so, don't shoot so the it, same. It, it it doesn't affect your ability to take the shots. 
no. if you're Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Yeah. You can get them off. Yeah. You can still get them off, but you probably will be shooting as badly as you were before that. They're not going in. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in crunch time. You, you become one of Commissioner Gordon's lackeys after you tear your kills. But so... Paul Gasol's minion. Yeah. But you, you bring up math, but I think what you're bringing up is actually... Metric, I test. Metrics? I test. Because there's not enough data. Like, we don't have enough players to know, and they're all so different. Um, and uh, I think you could talk about each individual one of these players differently with their injury. And I was watching Boogie Cousins play, and he looked okay sometimes and horrible other times. But he's not fully recovered, and he's coming off of another leg injury. So I don't think we're going to see him... Uh, we won't be able to make a definitive evaluation of his injury, that injury, until like two years from now. Well, just to backtrack all the way to what Jordan said a while back when I decided I needed to get a couple finals takes off, we're now at a more chaotic league than at any point since the Warriors emerged as a championship team. So for the first time in four or five years, the league looks wide open in a way that we have not seen because, of course, Clay is out for probably most of next season. Katie is out for all of next season, even if he was going to resign with Golden State, which we don't know. And now we're entering a off season where there's already a lot of tumultuous activity. Well, I think that was about to happen anyway because of just the uh, amount of top tier free agents all hitting the open market at the same time. Like I, don't, I can't remember any year There's three, in, right? in, all the, in all the years that... Kyrie, Kawhi, and Durant were the three top. And then the second tier would be Tobias Harris, Jimmy Butler. Uh, just want to name these guys. Clay Thompson, Kemba Walker. Like There's a lot of talent If out there's there. a good player whose name starts with K, he's a free agent. Kevin Love. Quo. Um, <laughs> Kevin Love's not a free agent. No. Neither am I. Al Horford. Get out of here. Cal Corford, wow! <laughs> Can't wait till Brand gets his hands on him. I don't know if the interns have ever ever used Cal Corford. <laughs> <laughs> we got to rattle their cages, wake them up. Um, but you're right, and we got to talk about AD because that's that's the news, right? What do you mean? What happened? I didn't catch this trade while I was traipsing. He he told the NBA or uh, the media that he was going to stay in New Orleans and then sign with the Knicks when he's a free agent next year. It's going to be amazing. Everything's coming up Knicks. So the first shoe dropped for the uh, Los Angeles franchise. Or the second shoe dropped, right? The first shoe was Magic Johnson quitting. Uh-huh. The second shoe is them trading for Anthony Davis. No, the second shoe... Shoe is the gift of the rambi. The third shoe is Anthony Davis. Okay, Anthony Davis is the third shoe. <laughs> so the rambi. Is there a fourth Wait, shoe? He, he has to be in Space Jam 2 now, right? Contractually. Well, that's the new conspiracy. Is that uh, the, yeah. Oh, it really is? The, all these guys are going to yeah. get like $1 million deals with the Lakers and then get paid $6 million to be a, a cameo in yes. Space Jam? Is, so, that, is that true? Yeah, so AD has a $4 million trade kicker, yeah. and they would love that money to offer... Kyrie in a contract, so um, uh, LBJ might pay him back through other. Avenues. I mean that makes sense, but also if you if if you like piss and moan your way to an organization and then won't waive your four million dollar trade kicker as a dude worth three hundred million dollars, then you're oh that's a lot not, of money though. Four million is a lot of money. It's not, yeah, I mean it, you can do some stuff with four million. Like yeah. you, can, you can do some stuff quickly. with four million, but if you're not getting seconds. if you're not getting another top-level player or point guard to help you win a championship. Like, David West spent more money buying his ring than that. Yeah. So this thing that I mentioned isn't like, no one thinks that Tim he'll Duncan do it, bought but all it's his been rings. mentioned. Dirk and Tim before. Duncan bought all the rings. Go on. <laughs> the, the thing that I mentioned about his $4 million isn't like, everyone assumes he's going to take Wave that it. money. Uh, uh, take think, that money. There's only a few people who think he won't, with the conspiracy people. Think he won't take that money? But then don't... Uh, isn't it difficult for the Lakers to sign another player, specifically Kyrie Irving? Let's back unless... up a half step. Okay. Uh, so the trade, uh, AD goes to the Lakers for a bevy of assets. Um, I love that word. Bevy? Assets. It's, it sounds like, um, both sounds like a bar. <laughs> I would go to assets bar. I got wasted at the bevy last time. Yeah. Well, I mean, makes sense. Beverages. Yeah. Cokies, which then later became the bevy. Yes. Which is an actual place. I went to Cokies back in the way. Back in the day. Ooh. Back in the way. Yeah. The it, days of way back. It was as wild as you think it was. 
there was a little. You guys have been there, right? Yeah. Yeah, that little uh, slot where you put your money through, and then someone you can't see their face or arm, just their hand go through with some substance, probably baking soda, very expensive baking soda. It's where they would sell flour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just... And it was called Cokies. <laughs> And cops were in there doing it. You guys are burying the lead here. <laughs> okay. So uh, Lonzo Ball, Brandon Ingram, hopefully he's better. Um, no Kyle Kuzma, um, your boy Josh Hart, and a bevy of draft picks that have all conditional attachments to them, kind of in the Pelicans' favor. Um, Mostly so, where they have the choice to take swap, picks or swap defer. them. Or yeah, push them back a year if they're not like as high as they would hope, et cetera. The thing that was shocking about that is when I was like, oh, that's a, a pretty decent hole, plus three first-round draft picks. And then I realized that included this year's draft pick. Oh, that's and number, the, the number, four. number four. Like, that's mental. It's, they, they bought a Lamborghini with their savings account, and they have that Lamborghini. And it's like, cool, how are you going to pay for insurance on this Lambo? They're like, I spent all my money on the Lambo. The phrase is house poor. <laughs> yes, that's right. So what I'm gathering from your feedback here, Quo, and maybe Jordan, is you guys think the Lakers paid too much. I think they, have, they got what they wanted, and they absolutely didn't learn from the lessons of Carmelo Anthony and yeah. the Knicks, uh, who made that crucial mistake. In the time, there were a few people who didn't like it, but mostly everyone was like, Melo to the Knicks, we'll just attach players to him, like old veteran contract shooters, and he'll be fine. It turns out it wasn't fine because... Good veteran players who are cheap are willing to pay for cheap, and shooters don't really exist. Like, there's a few of them in the league, and you have to pay for them. Looking at the Lakers roster right now, they've pretty much sloughed off all decent talent, except for Kuzma. Who's a playable guy. I mean, he's, not, he's the worst of that haul, but he's, you can play him minutes. I mean, he's a pretty good scorer. Yeah. Poor and shooter, poor rebounder, poor passer. Poor but, defender. Poor defender, but a solid scorer. Like, he can drop 40 on some nights. And then you look at the other guys on that roster. We're like, well, you traded uh, Zubek Zubac. for Muscala. Zubac. Zubac. Yeah, for Muscala, who's now a free agent and gone. So you didn't get anything out of that trade. That was an insane deal. That was to dump a contract, right? I forget whose. But it, Oh, it, yeah, um... Walking Buckets contract. So the Lakers are just sitting there with two all-universe space jammers. Amazing and, players. And basically nothing else. Nothing else. Uh, and they could have had AD for cheap, which is just money, and keep all their assets in a year, or even gotten like a better deal towards the end of this year when it was clear that AD was going to leave New Orleans anyway, and Griff... They basically lost a hand of poker really badly, and they didn't lose the whole night or game, but they, uh, Griff took their money. He bluffed, and he took their money. At the same time, for the sake of argument, even if you overpaid... You got one of the best players. You overpaid for Anthony Davis, who says he's likely to stay there for a long time. Well, just, just for the sake of argument, he might be there for 10 Let's years. Let's just say he's going to resign. He might be there for the rest of his career, Laker for life after this. Guys generally don't leave the Lakers after they're in the organization. You know, I just, like, you're, until they don't want you anymore. You mean like Kobe tried to trade his, tried to force a trade twice and didn't work? Shaq left, Pau Gasol left. Yeah, but Pau left. Odom left. Pau, Pau, they all left. Like, they aged when, out. When they were, they were old. Like, generally, if you're on the Lakers and they're paying you and you're living in Los Angeles, you don't bounce. What if you're Anthony Davis, though, and after a year of shit showing at the fucking Lakers, you realize that you have liquidated your own future to uh, garnish the tail end of LeBron's legacy. Well, a very Could real... be worse, though, right? Yes. What do you mean could be worse? You could I be mean, in New Orleans with the worst Maybe, team. Maybe Anthony Davis's correct role in the NBA is the greatest Robin ever. Sure, but I mean, what if LeBron's done after two two years? Maybe, like, very much a big maybe surround them even getting to like the Western Conference Finals for me, with no discernible ability to build yeah. a a decent roster. Who's who's going to beat them? Well, we can't do that yet because yeah. the, it hasn't started. We, Free agency hasn't started. 
I'm just saying. The Houston you, Rockets could beat them right now. I'm just saying. If you have LeBron and Anthony Davis, I think you are favored in any playoff series in the West right now. I disagree. It would be the Rockets. But we don't know what the rest of that team is. I disagree. Is. Yes, yes. And uh, the, we can't do the Vegas thing because Vegas is hedging towards Lakers fans who are betting money. So the fact that Vegas is favoring the Lakers means not, very little. But yeah, yeah, I don't trust Rob Polinka to build a functional team around LeBron and Anthony Davis because we saw that this was a front office that went and got Beasley and Rondo. Like, they are terrible at this. Probably going to retain Rondo. He just got swindled. Well, Rondo played quite himself. well with Anthony Davis, right, on the Pelicans. True, but it's a different team a few years later. Um, but Rondo is like a serviceable guy, but I wouldn't love him on that team. Uh, they're looking at like the Gary Temples, Gary Temples of the world. Um, there's no shooters. Everyone's like, there's like five teams that want shooters. Like, just surround them with shooters. I'm like, show me the shooter that you can afford. So my theory here, and we've been working with this for a little while, is that shooting is by far the most overrated trait right now. Everyone, you can get shooters wherever you want. They may not be elite I disagree, shooters. But, yeah. well, you guys just said complete opposite. Things. Yeah, I disagree with that. I mean, <clears throat> you can but always I know where you're shoot. going. You can with always this. get shooters. They need to do more. But than getting just shooters shoot. who can dribble or defend or or do or you know attack the basket that's different. You but, can always get someone who can shoot. And the first name that always comes up this offseason is Redick, and he's going to cost you money. And there's one of him. Like Corver is not going to help you anymore. I just think. Unitaskers are so beyond done. There is not even a use for those guys anymore. But this is what the Lakers are looking at, unitaskers, because they're not valued anymore. So they're going to have to find people to slot in. And it's going to – they could do it. It's, it's going to have to be a masterful kind of rebuild. But um, I feel like even 3 and D dudes are like almost on the verge of being – not obsolete, but a lot less useful than they were a couple of years ago. Code Blue, we, we talk about this every episode. Yeah, I agree. They have to do one more thing. And we'll talk about that with the draft because that really plays into what's happening there. But, like, there are no, like, but there, there are no available 3 and D guys except for Chris Middleton, who's going to cost a lot of money. Right, right. And that's the thing. Everyone's like, well, and just get a couple 3 and D guys. Who? Yeah, they don't Who exist. are they? Is it Robert Covington? Is it... Um, is it Middleton? Is, is it, it Trevor Ariza? Right. There's basically the same list of four dudes. Ariza back to the Lakers? Maybe. I mean, you know, and, he's, uh, he's out there. And Danny Green. We've heard the same five guys, maybe the Bays guy. But there's basically four or five guys that we yeah. always mention, 3 and D, 3 and D, 3 and D. The problem is most guys aren't really good defenders, aren't really good shooters, and aren't that limited. And if they are good, they're Paul George. Right. Or they're Kawhi Leonard, or they're yeah. Middleton. They're borderline stars. Right. Just this idea of these guys who are like lockdown defenders who knock down threes, there aren't. Yeah. And it's interesting. Uh, I was going through the biggest trades in history, um, not free agent signings, the biggest like moves. And, you know, Mello could be there. I think like maybe a dozen players changed hands. Uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar to the Lakers, Wilt Chamberlain to the Lakers. The Lakers do this. And, like, uh, Genie Bus has that memory of all these things. Shaq. Shaq. Uh, Shaq was free agency, I believe. Mm-hmm. Didn't he oh, sign maybe, with no, Orlando? No, they did, that's right. They did a trade to get rid of money with, like, right. George Lynch and those guys. And then I think they did sign him. Yeah, because he... I think. Yeah, there was a documentary about it. He left Penny. But, um, as a free agent. But, uh... Pennyless? The, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, well, I was I was ch- channeling you. How? Because you like the pun jokes. I do. Yeah. So there was uh so those trades were, um, classic Lakers trades, right? Like I think they look at something like Anthony Davis and be like, "This is how we found success before, and this is how, how we'll find success again." Um, which well, is the Lakers incorrect, are right? the Lakers are doing some boomer shit. They they're are saying, They're saying this yeah. is right. They're the boomer organization. Like, we want guys who were hanging out with, like, the Barbie twins in 1987 in L.A. That's our culture. Lakers mystique. And what we do is we trade for stars. Mm-hmm. And then we... We figure it out later. And we figure it out and we win championships. Have you guys noticed with your friends who are Lakers fans who have grown up with the Lakers, they think like this too? And I'm talking about real Lakers fans who like watched the the Magic era and the Shaq era. They think like this as people, just being like, 
oh, I just want like the best apartment I can get. I just want to max out my credit card and I'll figure it out later. And I'm like, oh my God, you're a Lakers fan. Like this is like ingrained in your It's a fake it till you make it thing. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Um, It's like, uh, do you want to, like, how was your night last night? And it's like, oh, I went big. We went to that restaurant. I dropped like 500 bucks. I'm like, yo, how was that? And we're like, I don't know. I'll figure it out later. You know, it's just like this kind of uh, ethos of, I don't know, I'm stretching here. But like, I think the way you look at things you're obsessed about, like whether it be basketball or cars or the stock market, influences the way you just act. And uh, yo, Lakers fans are really happy about AD. Lakers, it's, like, it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's a valet taking the, the, uh, the convertible Corvette for a spin. Yeah, like Ferris Bueller? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Lakers are very oh, comfortable yeah. operating in debt, yeah. and that's gotten them in a lot of trouble. They've done everything wrong for seven years. They've mm-hmm. fucked up every step of the way. Bad coaching decisions, bad hires, bad signings, bad trades, everything. And they're like, hey, look, man, we got two of the top five players on the planet. What are you going to say to us? Like, they, and and they ver- do have a point. But, but that's what I'm saying. You can look and be like... Their well, success. You are in a Lamborghini. I guess that's true. That's the thing, right? <laughs> like, and we have two Lamborghinis now. Yeah. It's and a, you want to race. Yeah. It's like the analogy thing I'm going nuts with today, but like it's like paying forty dollars for a compact disc, being like, yo, that thing could have cost you twelve and like, but I love the songs on it. I'm like, true, those are that's Mariah Carey's greatest hits. Those are great songs, but you paid forty bucks for it. It's like, but I love the songs. Like you can't argue with it. Does this make sense to you as a record collector, Jordan? A CD collector. A CD collector. Um, <clears throat> yes. It just took me a while to wrap my head around it. No, but I you know it. what I mean? You enjoy it. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much you pay for it if it's the thing you love the most. Mm-hmm. And the humidity is playing tricks with your hair, Jordan. Very humid in New York today. Humidity? What are you talking about? It was pouring rain outside. My hair was wet. Now it's... Drying. That's also true. I haven't, I haven't seen it looking like this in a while. I know I look like uh, fucking what's his name, homeboy from an ER who was in Coming to America. Got that soul glow. With oh. The mustache, Eric. Uh, oh yes, Eric Laforte. Eric La La Laforce. Yes, La, La something. You know who I'm talking yeah, about? Of course, yeah. that dashingly handsome. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. I love him. That was. Where I thought I'd seen you before. Yeah. yeah. Singing for Soul Glow. You got that Soul Glow. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot he was in Coming to America. <laughs> <laughs> You've been getting great pop on your, on your, your pounds today. When you and Quo exchanged a handshake shop. at the coffee shop, and it sounded like it was like an, oh, an active shooter. It was like Maverick and... Jesus. Um, what's his name? Tom Cruise and Top Gun? What's his name? Goose. Maverick and Goose. I'm sorry. Can we talk some draft? Are we no no? Well, let's let's, let's still stay with the the brow because. Can, well, can we briefly touch on on the uh, on the winners of this trade? The sure. Pelicans. I think so, but yes. Uh, I, annoyingly, I hedge because they got the Mariah Carey CD. Yes, like they so they're enjoying their day. They're jamming out to the greatest hits. They're having fun, so they're not losers. But I'd rather have uh, the that Mariah Carey CD plus. Two other CDs. Well, the Pelicans are huge winners here because they got more than what they thought. They got so they got that, everything. That's all it is. Like that's the biggest haul of any I've seen in when, history. When Jimmy Butler made it clear that he wanted to leave with one season left, the, there was a prolonged period of discomfort with the Wolves, and then they traded him for Covington and Dario, solid players. That's under, a great haul under, for that. Under good contracts, etc. And the brow is better than Jimmy Butler. But the Lakers gave up the farm. They gave up so much. And it's so much more for a guy with one year on his contract than I can think of, even, like way more than Mello. I uh, mean, the, the Knicks gave up in the Mello deal, like what, two draft picks? They gave up Gallo. Put some respect on Raymond Felton's name. No, no, solid players, solid players. Wilson Chandler, Mozgov, legends all. Lakers legend, Timothy Mozgov, champion. Or Him and Ben Simmons both have one champion. Proud member of the Orlando Magic. But <laughs> this is a lot more. But it's basic, it's it's basic psychology, Ben. All right. So say I want four of your vintage rap shirts. Mm-hmm. And I have the mm. fucking best 
vintage Frasier shirt you've ever seen. Wow. And I'm like, give me those shirts for this one Frasier shirt. Like, I'll give you two. I'm like, no, give me four. Like, no, I'll give you three. No, give me four. Like, no. And then so I get the Frasier shirt and hold it over the stove. I'm going to burn that fucking shirt rather than not get four. What are you going to do? You're going to give me all four of your shirts because you might never see that fucking cool ass vintage Frasier shirt again. And also you're like... Now I understand. Now you understand. Now I understand the dilemma that Palinka faced. And the next two wrap shirts that you find are mine too. Yeah. If I like them, I can just take them from you. And then we can... I can do whatever swaps with t-shirts. Dude. (laughs) By the the way, Ben, this is one of the best five Frasier t-shirts available ever. And I'm going to burn it. I'm going to send it off to Boston. For, and you won't see it for another year. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have to wait a full year to wear this, this, this Frasier t-shirt. <laughs> One calendar year. Yeah. And it turns out the, the Celtics and the Knicks weren't close. Like their halls weren't even close because I don't think they offered their future. The Knicks have like their picks moving forward, but it wasn't offered. And their players aren't as good as Ingram and Ball, obviously. So what no one really talked about here was that What's pulling his job security like? That was, yeah. Is that, it that's particularly good? No, he's on the hot seat. So he's like, oh, we're going to give up the 2025 pick? Oh, no, don't do that. He's like, if we don't get Anthony Davis, I'm getting fired. Right, and that's an over... LeBron's overs- too powerful to have him sitting around here for a year playing with a bunch of scrubs and, and trying to get into that eighth seed. He's like, if I don't pull this off, I will lose my job. Therefore, swap... Of course. And that's the problem with making him president slash GM. There's no Other than the fact that he's not even good at his job, and he's also now taking into account the fact that he might get fired. So I look at it as like if you pull back enough, like they have two of – let's say they get Kyrie Irving. They have Kyrie Irving, uh, Anthony Davis. They have to move money around for it to happen. So it can't happen today. But if they give the Pelicans more, they they free up some money. Uh, they get those three guys, it, which is wild, right? But that's which why is the Pelicans the table. are the huge winner here. Yes, okay. They just got way more than a, a star with one year left. Kevin Love, awesome player. What did you get for it? Thaddeus Young, Anthony Bennett, and um, and and Wiggins. So, and also, yes, you're correct. And like, you're right. And like, the if you pull back far enough, if something happens to one of these guys, because you're assuming they have like Garrett Temples, like, and they're not and Rondos. And if one of these guys, if AD, I hope not, goes down, you miss the playoffs and you're in the lottery. The Pelicans have control over every bad um, uh, outcome that you have for six years, which is wild. And 2022 is going to be the double draft, meaning that's when high school kids are available. You want to be in that draft, and the Pelicans are protected. Uh, the Lakers are protected 8 through 30 in 2021, but then the Pelicans have their pick if it doesn't convey. And like they're just in control of the Lakers' future. Well, there's a huge, a huge chance that this ends up an absolute disgrace of a trade. For the Lakers, like an eighty percent chance, but they but they also might win a title this year. Yes, in, in a world where they were competent. Yes, like it is kind of a, an awesome trade for both teams. The Pelicans, like you lose your star, but you're like got this fun future coming yeah. up. And the Lakers, are like okay, nuts on the table. We have LeBron and Anthony Davis. Let's do, let's yeah, get it done. Finest bottle of what's, wine. What's I this, love it. Yeah, what's yeah. like the statute of limitations on something like that? Where it's like okay, five years. Five years. It's like you get a championship, but your future is over. You think it's only five years? I would say if you get a chip, you you earn you earn, earn tw- twelve to fifteen years of grace. Gotcha. I thought you, you were talking before about before you were even maybe competitive again. I thought you were talking about how far in the future you're allowed to trade the draft be- picks. Yeah, the oh, bean like, town is kind of mad. But like, what's the right? What's the thing? If you win this year, like obviously how- it's different in Los Angeles, but like for the Mavs, it's like they won. Yeah, you get a grace period of like a decade. Yeah, it's a decade, right? It depends. It's all different because the Bean Town or fifty years forgot. if you're the Knicks. Boston did forget that they won a title. Yeah, they're just like seething, mad, and uh, upset over the the you know, procedure. You hate to see it. I. It's you tough. really hate it's to see it. It's tough to watch what's, yeah. ha- what's happening in Boston, man. Like all those plans, you saw all that I- rebuilding. The fans, what they had to go through in this Boston rebuild to end up 
You get the guy everyone wants. He's great. You pay him all the money in the world, and it turns out he's a cancer in the locker room, and his name is Gordon Hayward. Oh, I thought you were talking about Cal Crawford, uh, future, who opted out and probably going to give him legend. a lot of money. Um, he is the true Elton Brand. <laughs> Can Elton bring him to Philly to fulfill the <laughs> Elton Brand in Philly destiny? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think the Lakers, yeah, you're right, because they have that Ferrari, and they're driving it down Franklin and Franklin Street, and they're psyched. Um, but They're going down Rodeo, bro. They're not in Brooklyn. <laughs> but until Nothing the, artisanal yeah, about the Lakers. Yeah. If something goes like clank in the, in the hood, to be like, oh, let's take us to the shop, I'm like, I got no money for repairs. So we're just going to have to drive this Ferrari until we can't drive it anymore. Is that... Chorus to Old Town Road. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take this Lambo down uh, Franklin Street. They played that ride. song every other commercial break on the finals. It was amazing, and uh, I heard it in in uh, Southern Italy. It's an amazing song. Shout out to Lil Nas X who has one song and is just milking it. I guess an EP is coming out in like two weeks, a week. We'll he's see. very he's incredibly self aware, which makes it really fun. It's great. It's fantastic. He had some like little Twitter thing where he was, I forget what the image was, but it was like, when the label says they want me to make a new song. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> He's like, that I can't just put out other versions of uh, Old Town Road on my entire album. He had an amazing tweet. It was just like, uh, just moved into my new apartment. I've never seen, I've never had a bathtub this big. I can't wait to cry in it. Like, That's pretty funny. He's pretty good. Oh, yeah, it's great. He's uh, Gen, Gen Z, man. So, all right. Lakers, we're going to see what happens with this team. Anthony Davis and LeBron, that's fun. Pelicans, now a must-watch team because they're oh, going to have all straight these to young the top guys. of the league pass class. Do you oh. think they trade the fourth pick? They want to win now, which is amazing because they have Drew Holiday still. So they're looking to flip the fourth pick for a starter, which is which is Bradley Beal. That would I'd watch that team. Zion, Bradley Beal, and Drew Holiday. Sign me up. And Lonzo, back, the guy. dude, that's back a good team. Lonzo. That's a good team. Also. Brandon Ingram was balling out before he went down with that blood clot. Sort I know of, that. I know of. that he's 21. You guys, that's which is mental that he's been in the league for three years and he's 21 years old. <laughs> yeah. But like 21 year olds do dumb shit. They take bad shots at bad bars. Oh, the he Kevin. Takes, the Kevin Knox uh, 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 Stan has logged on. I mean, yeah, they had bad coaching. He took bad shots. Yeah. What if they have good coaching? They have good shots. And also, what if he? Isn't the second, Everyone's a winner. The, what if he isn't the second best player on a bad team? What if he's like... What if your fifth the, best player. The, yeah. yeah. Your fourth or fifth best player on a very good team where you Josh buy into Hart the system. Josh Hart is also kind of good. I, I like all the guys they got. Yeah. I don't love Ingram, but I get it. Like He's yeah. got some tools. Maybe he can figure it out and be useful in a way that's not a star, but like, you know, a, a role player. And with they're some, all tradable with some pieces. Like, Griffith can... These are all movable assets. None of this is... Like, Drew Holiday is your most locked-in player, and he has a huge market if you make him available. It's amazing for the Pelicans. And even from a defensive point of view, Drew Holiday, Lonzo Ball, Ingram, not a great defender, but he's long and rangy. And then you got, like, Zion with his monstrous help oh, side defense. Oh, it's super defense. cool. It's and very... If you can trade the four for a star, or, you know, a, a say a Bradley Beal. If you're the Wizards, and you're like, all right, we're just pulling the plug on this whole thing. Let's cut our. Let's get rid of some money. We'll get an asset, and then you're a competitive team with some interesting players that are still young with Zion and the Lakers' future. You're in that like delightful position that Boston was before they bungled everything, where you're climbing towards being a contender with a good young team, but still reap the benefits of a garbage team potentially. Yeah, and that's like the Lakers that's might the be dream bad. scenario. Yeah, they they could be they, they could be the Thunder one they could, day. Pelicans could be like the Thunder, you know, win 25 games one year and then 55 the next. I'm very excited to watch Lonzo and Zion play together. Yeah. And, you know, it it looks good today the same way the Ainge trade with Brooklyn looked good that day. And a lot of things can happen. You can get Martel Webster in the draft. And then all of a sudden Billy King has the longest view in the room and has built an orchard orchard to the moon. (laughs) On Atlantic Avenue. I can't believe that Billy King won the trade after all these years. (laughs) Um, so you say we will get Kyrie Irving to come, but give me time. They're going to resign AD years. next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming back. I love Zion. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, so, I mean, Drew Holiday is so interesting because so many teams can use him. And then you look closer at the Pelicans roster and you're like, oh, they can use him. This is like potentially an eighth seed in the West. So moving along here out of this thing, we've got the draft coming up in a couple days and you are quo and you have a big board. The KBB, baby. How are you going to present this in a way that's not really annoying? Uh, let's not really talk about players. Let's just like, um, okay. I'll tell you how I, I do it. So what are we drafting here? I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> I'll, because if I, if I say Darius Garland, do you have a take? Yeah. What's that? Trash. His mom made amazing movies. Judy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but this is, okay, I want to start. She, she had him when she was 102 years old. <laughs> Close on the ropes. Uh, the big board is in shambles. Darius Garland's a great place to start, right? Because we make all these assumptions on these players that, like, Darius Garland played five games. Let me. These are the five teams he played. Winthrop, USC, which is legit, Alcorn State, Liberty, and Kent State. And we're basing his entire last year on those five games before he tore his uh, knee up. We know so little about this. So even looking at advanced stats doesn't really help us because they're playing Winthrop, you know? like, And he only scored three points versus Alcorn State. You know, like, it's all random. These are just babies, and they're playing not good uh, athletes from high school. So, whatever. But we know a lot. I just wish we had enough, as much scrutiny for NBA players as we do these draft picks because they dissect them down to, like, that minute versus Winthrop, you know? Uh, Which is what we're doing with Darius Garland, who's a tiny point guard that they think might be going in the top six. Okay, fair enough. (laughs) <laughs> Here's my question. No, I'm not disputing anything. Here's you guys, my... you guys hate the lottery until. It Here's happens. my question: Who are the stars as the KBB sees it in this draft? Let's not talk about maybe Darius Garland is one of them. But who are the stars to you that, if you are not a college fan but you like cookies because you like the NBA, what are the names to put on the radar? You mean like the hipster guys? But who is? Like I mean, other, who, other who can we expect to see make a little noise next season and beyond? And let's let's say obviously Zion okay. done, uh, obviously John Morant done, uh, and then not anybody else. That's it. This that was what dra- I was trying to figure out here. This is not a a high powered draft at the moment. It may change, and that happens all the time. John Morant goes number five or six from last year. Like this is not that good of a draft. But these are all smart players that are going to have long careers. Their, uh, their skill sets aren't top-heavy. Like, all these guys do a lot of things well, and then some things not well. There's no, like, like Bol Bol's the guy that's just, like, the sky or bust, you know? Like, I don't think you can draft Bol Bol or Jackson Hayes. That's a wasted pick, in my opinion. But uh, I would look after Nikhil Alexander-Walker because he's just, like, kind of a really great 3 and D guy who can pass. Um, the interesting thing is, like, what do you do with Cam Reddish? What do you do with R.J. Barrett, who clearly have a bad coach at Duke, right? Who's basically like ISO the best player, which is Zion, and just like wait until he kicks it out. Like it was just hard to watch Duke this year. Uh, well, so we, they're they're known as a one and done bust factory, and that is a reflection of having an overrated coach. That's the cross R.J. Barrett will have to bear throughout his NBA career. Um, being a one and done and a bust, but he's following in the footsteps of such. Legendary players as Luminaries. Jaleel Okafor, Jabari Parker, Jabari Parker, Corey Maggette, William Avery, <laughs> William Avery, Trajan Langdon, <laughs> um, Steve Wojciechowski, stars, uh, all yeah. the Hur- a Hurley, uh, the Hurley, pick a pick, <laughs> pick a pick a Hurley. All right, so you're the Knicks fan. How are you feeling about this? This fine. Just take R.J. Barrett. It's fine. He's he might be good. A space might help him. I think he's a point guard because he can handle the ball and he doesn't really perform that well at the three or at the wing. Uh, he should bring the ball up. His skills are handling and vision. So he is a poor man's Wiggins. I mean, Wiggins, who was put on the market yesterday, who blinked. Maybe the Knicks. Ooh, he's so destined to be the Knicks. But I was watching, so it went... Wiggins for Chris Paul, who says no. I mean, the money matches up. But, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> but the, um, the response from Twitter when that Wiggins news came out was amazing. Everyone's just like, put some respect on his name. He's like still young. You guys are judging this young player. You're just judging his contract. The dude can hoop. 
And I was like, he might be one of the worst players on the floor at any given time. He's a terrible player. He's really, really how, bad. How do they get rid of that contract when, like, I test, he looks kind of cool, he's got green sneakers, and he went number one, but... Double bias passes. Quite, yeah, he can, quite he can honestly, jam. everybody on the planet who isn't an idiot, which doesn't mean that there isn't a bunch of those in NBA organizations, but how do they get rid of somebody who is that expensive and that bad? Uh, Lakers and Knicks. Just call them. Um, and they might bite. Uh, the rumor LeBron's was like, the LeBron's like, I'm ready to play with you, Andrew. Well, the, la- the problem is the Lakers can't get the money in order well, for him, do. but the Knicks are really, yeah. the Knicks are the ones to watch. Yeah, the Knicks, uh, the Pelicans are smart enough to let Julius Randle walk, even though he had like kind of monster lines with them this year after AD uh, had to sit for a quitter management. Uh, but the Knicks are rumored to be in the Julius Randle Hunt and sweepstakes. <laughs> he is I, uh, not I, a good I, defender, and he's not going to help you. I think Randall is pretty good. He's a guy that he had a good season. He had a good season when he was on the Lakers. I liked some things about his game. When he gets so ahead of steam threes. and he's running down the, the, you know, running, leading the break. Zion he, Light. He's a very good passer for for a guy of his of his size and carriage. He's active. I enjoy watching his intensity. I think Randall's just like a cool player. He slaps the floor, man. He, he is optically the guy that I am uh, sure that the Knicks covet. Oh, no, no. It's, it's out there. The Knicks want him. It's so much in that Oakley. They want a max him. He's that Oakley yeah. Mason, like, yeah. oh, point forward who plays with passion. He's junkyard dog. He fits so into what the Knicks want. I've never seen him in a room with Elton Brand. Are they not the same person? They're just traveling back and forth through time. This is the height checkout. Because that always no. bothered me about Mission Impossible. Which one? All of them. They all wear these stupid masks, but everyone's different height. Like Tom Cruise is a foot shorter than everyone else on the planet. So what does it, what does it matter if he puts on somebody else's face if he's the wrong height? Did uh, I think Randall... Elton Brand and uh, Julius Randle are pretty... Uh, they yeah, have... like six foot seven. Yeah. Just throws on the, the, little, the little goatee. Yeah. Um, the thirsty goatee. The Elton Brand uh, carb thirst. Um, but yeah, the rumor is Julius Randle in New York, but we can make fun of the Knicks in a second. So you don't know, have to know anything about this draft because they're all just kind of whatever players, but you can check it out. Uh, the interns posted the KBB, so it's not fun radio, but I just think the, the science behind the draft is so loopy. And I agree with uh, Daryl Morey's, the Morey's and the, the Prestes who are like, we should be able to predict every pick every year. That's our job. But players... Teams are dumb, and uh, it's hard to tell what these guys are. So it's fun. As someone who does not watch NCAA basketball, which is weird, which is great and ethical, I do like the draft models where they basically use the college stats of guys who became stars in the pros and sort of reverse engineer it to be predictive and say, this guy has stats that match up with the kind of player who would perform well in the pros based on the past history of guys who have done that. I think those are interesting. As you said, the competition matters. It's a small sample size, all that stuff. But what always seems to happen is there are a handful of guys that fare really well by various sort of metrics, um, um, blueprints, and, and models, and they become this sort of group of cult favorites in the way that it used to be like the blogosphere but now you've got a few guys like that that are like the ones to watch and those guys often get drafted by the Spurs or the Rockets or Dallas and teams like that and some of those guys end up being good like Jordan Bell Max Player I love him but he was one of those guys that everyone's like get him in the second round Jay Crowder was one of those guys Um, I think I I believe Draymond Green was like that so who are the guys this year that are like the sleepers Late first, early second, that metrics dorks are really into. Uh, I don't trust metrics source, but I'll give you that list this year. Nikhil Alexander Walker is one of them. I don't think he's projected to go lottery, but I have him as number eight uh, in the big board. Matisse Tibouye. He's a guy that I see Sixers fans are, are into, and I've, I've read about him. He sounds like a good pick for like mid 20s to me. I don't. He's got a cool name. I have His name him, is Matisse. That's I have awesome. him as the 11th best player. Um, he's a. 
is a perfect defender, a wing defender. He's just like a gifted defender. He anticipates plays. He uh, switches really well. He he was just really good last year. Would uh, you make a Schritz hat for Matisse? Double. One of the best shirts I ever saw was, I forgot who made it, but it said the Picasso Bulls, and it was the Bulls logo, but like Cubist. That's okay. pretty cool. That was great. I can already picture exactly what it looks like. That was great, man. Is his last name pronounced... I don't know. The Bull, like Megan the Stallion? The Bull. It's T-H-Y-B-U-L-L-E. Matisse, the... The Bull. Bull. Um, but I, I think it's... I don't. I would never draft for need. I don't love drafting for need, but the Sixers have Zaire Smith, who like kind of is better than t I don't think you should ever draft for need when you've got literally two guys on your roster, basically. In yeah. the Sixers position, they don't have any players. Right. They have... MB, they have Simmons. You've got Zaire, who's more or less never played. And then Yeah, he's your draft pick. And there's no rookie. there's no one else on that roster at this yeah. point. Like TJ? Yeah, I mean they're yeah. not even there. Yeah, they're you like take the best player at twenty four. They have a bunch of second rounders. I'm like, yeah. just load up your entire roster yeah. with four rookies and just yeah. see who shakes out. So I think the draft is always a copycat thing. So like my example is always Dragon Bender was picked so high the next year after Porzingis. Like people just see things happen and think they've found the next Dirk or uh, whatever player um, was su- uh, like the next Donovan Mitchell. But um, I think a lot of people have been talking about who the Draymond Green in the draft always is. And that would be this guy PJ Washington or Grant Williams. And their makeups are pretty much like they're slow, but they're smart and they can pass. They're not great rebounders, but their IQs are high. I read about Grant Williams he reminds slow footed and a basketball genius like it eerily sounds a lot like Jordan Rodelli. <laughs> yeah. Count rebound, S- check. Sky hook, check. Sees um, the game differently. Point check. center, check. Um Jonte Porter is like Jokic light, but people are just saying that because we saw Jokic dominate, but he's a passing six eleven guy, but he doesn't do anything well. Yeah, those are all the guys that I the names that I see that I'm like, yeah, I like those weirdos. The guy, what's his name? Talon. Yeah, there's like squat with long arms. I'm like into that. Guy. Give, just yeah. p- I, if I'm drafting, give me all the weird freaks and yeah. sort them out. Yeah. Let me give you my hottest takes. I think Kobe White, the point guard, is better than Morant. Uh, could be better than Morant, but also could be better than Garland. Damn. Go on. I mean, no one. I mean, people are talking about it now, but he was a UNC. He's fast. He can shoot. Um, he's got amazing hair. He looks like uh, Evil One, Evil Two. Oh wait, he went to UNC. I remember seeing him. I think he sucks. No, he's okay. These guys all suck, kind of. They're not good. They, they're all, all Michael Carter Williams. They're all the Jeremy Lambs. Michael Carter Williams. Can we talk about how he ruined the Charlotte franchise when they were tanking to get AD, and then look what happened when the Pelicans got AD. Their the fortunes just changed with the lottery. And you sent us this article today about the the course is building for everyone to get rid of the draft. Being like, it's unfair that these players have to go play at these places and they can't choose their futures. And Well, it's funny because you have these two issues that are simultaneously bugging people. And oh, one not of them, Michael Carter Williams. Michael Kidd Gilchrist. I'm sorry. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. On one hand, you've got management and the league and owners being like, we got to do something about tanking. This is, it's fucking up our league. Late in the season, the games mean nothing because teams are tanking. And it's it's screwing with the competitiveness and the watchability of the NBA. On the other side, you've got advocates for the players being like, well, maybe guys aren't happy because they just end up playing in, in cities that are really far away from Home. where they live yeah. or where they want to be. Or friends. And, yeah, and they don't like the situation. They don't want to play for that team. And the place where those two issues come together is abolishing the draft. Well, then how, then how does it work with trades? What do you mean? Well, if, if someone doesn't want to play in a certain city, but then they get traded to that city, then... It, it, the oh, that's fine. That's fine. I think that's... A, sure, a, sure. Yeah, I you mean, have I've, to deal with that evil. But um, the draft is... That's tougher because um, they can't sign the contracts that they want, and like the, it's a descending um, like rookie scale, which is annoying. Uh, like Zion, I don't think was happy to go to New Orleans, but now he's okay with it. Um, he should have that choice. But R.J. Barrett was really happy to see him fall to three because he wants to play in New York. I don't know why, but good pastrami sandwiches, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I mean the solution that people propose that seems unlikely to happen 
is that players would just be free agents. That's the best with reveals all week. Um, like colorful, like Gordon Hayward, colorful reveals, you know? Um, but that's how they do it when, when they go from high school to college. Like they have a press conference and they have two hats and they pick one, you know? Um, and I think that's more fair. I think the lottery has proven itself to like not work well. Even with these flattened odds, I don't think this is what the NBA envisioned, just like the same amount of tanking. And the Lakers, and the result of this flattened lottery was that a top five player went to a big market. AD went to LA because they got the fourth pick, which was valuable to a small market. All right, is there anything else about the KBB that we should know? No, because you guys hate rookies. I like the rookies. I just don't like the KBB. Well, they turn into rookies in like, <laughs> in like overnight. And then I like them. Yes, I know. They're like gremlins. Yeah, it's true. So, are you expecting a lot of? Big trades. I want to see what New Orleans does with number four. It's going to be Culver probably. And he's kind of like a plotting Paul Pierce type of guy. Not as good as Paul Pierce. Paul kind Pierce of like, really like a good. Tatum. Oh, man. Pretty much, but can pass better than Tatum. And uh, is not the ball stopper that Tatum was. Uh, better, better scouting for Culver than Tatum, in my opinion. But uh, he also didn't go to the one-and-done butts factory, so you have to handicap the players who do. Um, but, are we done with the KBB? Is there a place people can check this out online, perhaps, on Twitter? Our interns, I think Brandon Clark. That's all. I want to mention Brandon Clark because he's awesome. And he's not touted, but I think he's a top five guy. So the Knicks have their third pick. The guy that they expected to come sign and save the franchise, Kevin Durant, is out for the next year. Should still sign him. They were interested in Kyrie who now seems to be having heavy flirtations with the Brooklyn Nets. Respect to Kyrie. Better decision. But, so you're the Knicks. You've got the third pick in the draft, and it, but it looks like your plan. You traded Porzingis, who was supposed to be the future of the franchise, to open up two max slots, and you're now looking at using that on Randall and... D'Lo. I don't know. And D'Lo. R- exactly. Whatever. Like two guys who are not worth that kind of money. True. Are we close to nightmare scenario here for the Knicks? No, because we, the Knicks aren't part of the NBA. If there was a relegation, the Knicks are already there. Like, we're not in this discussion with, like, did they get the right player? We are just like, is that team still operational? You had mentioned this idea that the Knicks aren't in the NBA before. And I'm kind of into this theory. They just don't exist. It's like, I just rewatched The Others last night, you know, or like Peep Show was like, are we the baddies? Like, the Knicks are uh, in relegation. They don't know it because they, they are in it, but the rest of the league knows it. I don't believe I've intentionally watched a game for about two years, so I tend to agree with you. They, they, they sit sort of... Well, they're not good, and like, why would you? I watched all 82 last year, maybe, like 80. Not good. You missed nothing. No, I know. That's why I... Actively chose to, Although, to do Mitchell something Robinson, different. Mitchell Robinson, that was exciting. He blocked like nine shots once. Well, the thing is, it's not only do they exist outside of the NBA, but they also exist in and of themselves in their own sphere. Maybe. I mean, they're still in the lottery. But yeah, totally. They're just out. They're, but just, they're like just orbiting. Like the Knicks, if you know what I mean. What do you but mean? there is this idea that well, they can exist separately. From, they can exist and, and or subsist separately from the rest of the league just because of the... Collective uh, bargaining agreement. Well, no, I just mean like the fandom. Like, uh, well, yeah. right. What's interesting about them is that you can put the NBA into these sort of tiers of competitiveness and relevance and all those things. And the Knicks are always relevant yeah. because they're the Knicks and it's New York City and it's this media market and they have a huge fan base and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of actual relevance, they're on like the Phoenix Suns lower. Uh, that, I mean, they have no relevance. They have, after trading Porzingis and now Dude. unable to likely sign any huge name, like they are just so outside of the sort of circumference of up and coming teams, of relevant teams. I mean, they are just. They have nothing. They have zero, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a zero talent team, except for perhaps Mitchell Robinson. But they don't. It's a huge talent. But the teams in relegation have 
talent and good players. You know, they're just not a part of the Premier League and no sin bin, but there's a team in baseball that's doing this exact thing in theory, which is like, they're just not going to compete, the, the Florida Marlins. So like, we're just going to get part of this revenue sharing, get our money, and we're just not going to spend any money or participate in the way that normal Major League Baseball teams do. No sin bin, but like the, the Knicks aren't relevant. Like what they do you know, people will come after me on Twitter and just being like, oh, my God, you must be so LOL, you know, like your tears are my PEDs, whatever. Uh, and that's a ESPN line. Uh, your tears to, are my performance-enhancing drug? Shout out to Amin Al-Hassan. That's pretty uh, dark. But, like, they're not a part of the league. So I don't think the Knicks are in the discussion as, like, the Suns or um, – uh, the Pelicans now, like, or the Orlando Magic. We're in a different tier, and the tier is not uh, within the or, uh, galaxy of the NBA. When I looked at that Porzingis trade when it happened, I feel like both you guys were kind of praising it. And it's like, well, they opened, up, it. they opened up these two max slots. And to me, that trade generally was going to be calamitous unless they got lucked out. Because my theory going back with the Sixers and stuff is that opening up cap space is not a plan. No, it's, it's, it's for it's, sure. It's, it's the plan. absence of a plan. It's no, like, no, that is you, a plan. You, but it's not, it's not a plan. It, no, it's, it's a plan. It just didn't work out. Like, Durant getting hurt, it, they still have cap space, and if they spend it or not, whatever. Like, it is an actual plan. But my point is, like, we can call it a plan, but it means that you don't have a plan. Saying that our plan going forward is just to spend a bunch of money and, get, and sign people. It's like, that's not a plan. That that's is literally a plan. Well, it's a plan, but it's not a point of view. It's a plan that might not work, but it's literally a plan. Let's look up plan. on the. Well, I mean, it, that's I'm what saying, four teams are doing right now, and they're going to get the players they want, and then you're not going to say, that's not a plan. But what I mean is... Like the Nets did that. Opening up cap space is not the Nets' whole plan. Not the whole plan, but, but that's, it that's was. That's what I'm saying. But you the need Knicks, to do that. But I'm saying the Knicks had no plan except for to open up cap space. I mean, they're going to draft R.J. Barrett, who is going to be a player that has a value in a trade or whatever. Number three pick is great. Not in this draft, but they got this pick. It's just bad luck. So well, with the Knicks... But, oh, okay, so... I, uh, I've been listening to you guys go back and forth about what it, what is and isn't a plan for a couple of minutes now. So what I think is you are you are right, Andrew. They do have an actual plan, but their plan is based on nothing but wishful thinking. And that's what it really boils down to is like there's there's it's more of like the idea of best laid plans. And they don't they don't have a point of view they don't have any clear direction they're just hoping that like uh like the chips fall their way so it's they they plan to put themselves in a position where they might be able to wishfully thinkingly succeed but so, it's not really a good plan right so that's what leads to this point here like where they are right now which was they were going through this sort of regular rebuild. They were drafting young guys. They were playing young guys. They were going to be bad this year and hopefully get Zion. And they had this seemingly patient approach to becoming a young team with talent. And then they, which they are. And that, but going through that, and then they took this quick departure, traded off the one star that they had. And we're like, now we're young and rebuilding with assets, but we're also actually trying to compete right away. Well, they have both, right? They have both in play. I mean, the Porzingis thing is more complicated than we can get into, but, like, he told them he was, like, out. He, he asked for a Well, trade. we're not going to relitigate that because I disagree with all that shit. I, I, mean, don't, I don't believe anybody saying that they're going to not take an RFA. I no, no, that, uh, new news came out after that, that he was just, like, trade me. I believe you were in uh, Italy when that happened. But my thing here is now that the Knicks are likely not getting stars... What's the approach? Are you going to say now, okay, Randall and Wiggins are our guys. We're going to go get some young guys. you talking like the Knicks are part of the NBA. We just figured out they're not a part of this. For sure. But 
they have a bunch of money. Are they going to do like the Sam Hinkie thing and say, no. we're going to absorb a bunch of bad contracts in exchange for picks? I don't think they will. No, I no. think they're going to spend their money. Of course they are. Um, but asking them to do the thing that our favorite guy did is like a high standard. They're probably just going to be a regular ass big market team that spends their money on Julius Randle and D'Lo. And then they're going to walk eventually. Um, It's just going to be standard procedure. But, like, I forgive them not only because they're not in the NBA, but because, like, Durant got hurt, man. That's all. Like, that was a a good gamble on their part, and they probably knew something that we all assumed that they knew. And he ruptured his Achilles tendon. Like, in the finals. Like, that sucks. That's all. And they didn't get Zion because lottery balls didn't go their way, but they had the, the biggest chance. That sucks, but that's just what it is. It's like it's the Charlotte Hornets thing. It's like they wanted Anthony Davis, and that would have set their entire decade in motion potentially, but they got Michael Kidd Gilchrist, who ends up having no value. Well, yeah, but then also, yeah, okay, so therefore then everything either sucks or doesn't suck because the Pelicans, yeah, the Pelicans got Anthony Davis, and that didn't really do shit for them. How many number one draft picks in the last 10 years have been? Like big time busts, like quite. Couple. Anthony Bennett, Andrew Wiggins, your your Bar-90. boy. But then everyone else has been solid. Like Bagnani, I, no, like last year. What was his name again? <laughs> your Sixes guy, Aiton. He's good. Fultz. Fultz, like oh yeah, that's a bust. But Aiton. also, but like that's a that's a lot. That's like forty percent of the last ten draft picks have been not only like oh they're that. they're middling at best. They're like unplayable dudes. I mean, look, at the, look at the year when you had, you had Wiggins, you had Parker, then Embiid became a superstar. Then in that it was draft, supposed to be the number one pick, but, but bad luck, like, he got hurt. Then you have Gordon, you have Smart, you have like a couple solid guys. But yeah, the draft is, is a crapshoot. And going back to the process, the whole point was that you need a bunch of shots at this. Well, I disagree that the draft is a crapshoot. I just think teams are a crapshoot because a lot of people didn't like Wiggins. But when you're that bad, you have the choice to take Wiggins. Smart teams aren't in the position to take Bargnani. So another thing that's been going on in the NBA is people just keep talking about metrics as if this is new shit. So Jalen Rose recently had an interview with The New Yorker, and he brought up a couple issues that involved metrics and former players and race. And this is similar to what... Josh Hart said a couple weeks ago when he sort of voiced displeasure with metrics and analytics. What was your takeaway from the, the Jalen Rose interview? I mean, he, he brought it together some kind of important and complex ideas. I don't know if they all ran together exactly correctly. What were those ideas? So he, um, you know, people have been Josh Hart, uh, Charles Barkley, um, a bunch of ESPN talking heads during the day don't like metrics. Uh, and, that, and that's fine. It's already here. We live in the world of metrics. It's, so uh, the Jalen Rose interview with The New Yorker went kind of sort of as a topic of conversation because he equated it to like you have this toolbox and the metrics is a wrench and not the box. And I claim it's a box. But he went to a different place where he started equating it to race, not in terms of like who gets jobs in front offices, who plays on NBA courts. He started going back into race in a socioeconomic way with like colleges and how we uh, teach um, the things we know as adults to young people and the opportunities people get, for which he was not wrong at all. But he was pointing out something that was kind of bigger than just sports. But to keep it there, um, I thought it was kind of an outdated take a little bit. And him throwing race into it is legit, and it's about a lot of American history and with the way colleges do their thing. But um, that was a trump card that he brought out, which I thought was, no pun intended, but also I thought like a form of just like, okay, but what about this, this hot button thing that's really difficult to discuss? I think what Jalen said makes a lot of sense considering who he is. And if you think about the idea that players should have a future as management, coaching, part of front offices from a sort of Marxian way that 
you are the product. You are the players. That's who people watch. That's why you have this big contract with, you know, cable channels. It's the players. They are what people come to see. They are why people buy tickets. Therefore, they should go and later be rewarded for that contribution with jobs afterwards. And it's the same way as saying coal miners, after they all get black lung and their backs give out, they should they management. be able to work in management? Like, should, after giving what they can to the game and creating this, shouldn't they then be able to enjoy the, the fruits of what they've helped to create? Management should reflect the field. So I understand that idea from Jalen Rose's perspective. I also understand what he's saying about the, demogra- the, demogra- the, demogra- the demographic yeah. makeup. Yeah. I'm saying I understand what he's saying. Yes. And from the demographic makeup of the NBA to say, why don't front offices reflect the demographics of the league? Why aren't all coaches and staffs and general managers? Why don't the ha- percentages line up with the percentages of the league? Right. And he's saying, so if, you know, American born black dudes are good enough to be the product, then why aren't they also good enough to be the people in charge of the product at a managerial level? I think both of those make total sense from the Jalen Rose perspective. Mm -hmm. I also think of it a little bit like, does that mean that all art galleries should be run by artists? Does it mean that all movies should be made by actors? Right. And I'm like, where does this stop? If they're Bradley Cooper, the answer is yes. That makes sense. Um, But it's like, where does this stop? Does it mean that all pundits who talk about the NBA and all should be former players. Does it mean that all bloggers, all podcasters, all writers, all marketers, anyone who's involved with this NBA as a product should be a former player? Like, okay, get Latrell Sprewell out there. We've got to get a cameraman. Like, yeah. I'm like, also, where does this go? It's also, it's not like life begins at 35. Like, they've been playing for 15 years. There might be somebody else just as qualified who's been watching fucking video for 15 years that they have a head start on these particular positions like it's a skill set and it's a skill set that is is learned it shouldn't i don't think it should be automatically uh like given to somebody else who's already been paid handsomely for their prior work and we went through this with like cynthia nixon right like we don't want a representative who's never been a representative before and like, well, why not? If they win, they win. I mean, without mentioning the most famous politician in the world. Well, I mean, I'm with, with Jordan's perspective on it where it's like, of course it's cool if former players have a chance to continue their career off the court. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's cool. Unless it's Ryan Holmes. <laughs> oh, man, he's bad. <laughs> but I think it's also, as Jordan said, not every job is for the guy who happened to be really, 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 really good at basketball. The guys who are 0.999999 percentile good at the sport are not necessarily the guys who would be in that same percentile at running a team or being an analyst or writing about it or being a broadcaster, etc. There are a bevy or even being or even being interested enough in that role at that capacity, at that limited capacity. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I used to be out there dunking on people and, and, and playing, and now I'm expected to look at this in a, in a completely different light. Yeah. When there could be somebody qualified who's like, this is exactly what I want to do, this is what I'm good at, and this is my version of dunking on somebody. Before we go too far, to give Jalen Rose credit, who I'm a fan of, he's not talking about this. Like, I think this has been sussed out, especially in Sinbin, other sports, and uh, especially the NBA, and they're trying to fix it, and they've put in rules, and this is like what we're talking about is been accepted. Um, I think the interesting thing and why that interview went viral is because he was talking about, he was going farther into the origin story of how we got here, which is what we're talking about. He was saying, are the fans, is the culture inherently biased in a way that is uglier than we think? When we talk about um, metrics versus eye tests, is that code for something else? He's not talking about jobs. Well, I think he definitely was. Uh, he was absolutely talking about jobs because but, he was yeah. saying specifically that the idea of being versed in metrics was something that was added as a qualification in order to 
intentionally skew the criteria to benefit white people who came from like a college or academic background or via the organization starting as an intern or whatever and working their way up versus guys who played. Okay, that, so that your experience was not experience let's in say, your life, right. but experience was this is not taking a, college This statistics. is not a notion that's been foreign to Jalen Rose. He talked about this when he was in college. Yeah. Let's say we got him on this. We got him. Okay. But what he, the thing I loved about that interview is because he was talking about the, the culture that surrounds the discussion, which is what we're having. And him, I think in the interview, he was just like, this goes back to like the, the space fans allow themselves. It's like, why does someone who's never played tell me that I'm doing it wrong? Like, is there a cultural thing there? Because that person sometimes looks a certain way and it's not like me. And I thought that was interesting. And that, that's, that's the twist he put into the debate we've been having forever, which shouldn't even be a debate, but he's, he's right. You know, like there is a socio kind of thing that has to evolve um, before it's this whole idea of like data is accepted by people who don't like data. But that's kind of what I don't understand in general about this whole discussion, whether it's with Josh Hart or Jalen Rose about metrics and putting that in quotes or analytics, because I think a better tactic, if you're Jalen Rose, you'd be like, wait, you're telling me who's lived my life according to field goal percentages and free throw percentages and points per game and knowing where my spots are and knowing what plays we're trying to run that I don't understand metrics. Of course I understand metrics. Instead of drawing a line in the sand and saying, I'm on the other side of that. We're anti-metric over here. Why not just say, if anyone can understand metrics, yeah. it's former players. They've dealt with it literally their whole life. I've signed contracts. I've dealt with the CBA. I've dealt with other players. I've dealt with agents. Like, why not say metrics are second nature to players? Yeah, and instead of pretending like it's something that's like yeah, for dorks, metrics metrics might be second nature to players, but sitting in front of a computer for sixty hours a week, crunching those numbers in order in a way to my glasses describe yeah in a, in a way to describe or make it um, palatable yeah. to other people is completely different. You could understand yes. them in your own realm in your own way with your teammates that, and it's a learned experience, but. I think they're two very different things. Also, the other thing I know is I'm bad at math and not great at basketball. So who the fuck am I? Well, I'm mostly saying that he can make the claim that like, okay, okay, just explain what you mean by metrics and we can get that. We can understand. If you're saying we need someone who can knock down corner threes, okay, cool. I get what that means. I'm, I'm a player. We've done this for our living. I know who I'm allowed to let shoot who I'm supposed to drop off and, and, you know, play in the paint and help off of. That's metrics. I just, this idea that this amorphous, like, nerddom of analytics that people are hostile to, like, what exactly are you hostile towards? Are you just mad at, like, PER? So, are you mad at VORP? Like, it seems to me that someone like Jalen and that's kind of what they're annoyed by, the cumulative composite metrics that, don't really reflect stuff, but no one actually cares about that outside of internet arguments. Like, uh, I, I find myself not really caring about this debate because, or what Jalen said, um, because we're already living in the Tron thing. Like, it's already metrics-based. But uh, the thing I loved about that interview was he does this thing that I wish, wish more metrics people did do, which is instead of um, aligning themselves with ways to look at things like rest, uh, like you said, like not corner threes, but like who you stand next to, what do you do when you don't have the ball in your hands, like all these advanced metrics things, people have used this to kind of like form a tribe around this this idea. And I love Jalen for the idea that I wish these metrics people had, which is we have to question how we got there constantly. So he's just like, how do we get here? Why? Why? And sometimes when I hear the analytics community being like, you know, a little too, no pun intended, black and white. I'm just like, I wish they had more of Jalen in them being like, oh, the equation's wrong. But at the same time, Jalen's point that, you know, metrics should be a tool in the toolbox. But it's like, man, no one thinks it's everything. 
no one does unless we're all talking about the same thing. I, I do think. I, I mean, I just said it is the toolbox, so I'll, I'll sign on that. But I just mean, he's like, it's like to me, it's like he's griping at people don't write letters anymore. You know what I mean? Why, why write letters when you've got the fucking internet? Um, mm, I don't know if it's. I know where you're going with this. I don't know if it's quite get off my lawn. Is I, it some boomer shit? It might be some I mean, boomer shit. Obviously, he's a literal boomer, but he's a, like he's a boomer. Yeah, but like and he's listening to boot camp. <laughs> like oh, double double X posse. He's down for Louisville Slugger. The original Gun Clappers is on <laughs> rotation, say, man. Helter Skelter. Oh, oh, he definitely loves like ninety five to infinity. Debate yeah. Coco Brothers. Wait, was it 90, or Black 90, Moon? Was it ninety five, ninety three to infinity? <laughs> yeah. What year was it? Ninety three to infinity. I think it's ninety three. Yes. Okay. We can ask ninety nine to infinity. We can ask Jalen though. He'll know. Lyricist Lounge one or two. Sound bombing. One or two. Oh. Lyricist Lounge 1 for sure. <laughs> Bring hip hop back. <laughs> what a track. Um, but I had, uh, so there was a follow up interview with another ESPN guy, and I had gotten to uh, like a brief, a good hearted Twitter exchange with him years ago when he started going off about Trap Call Quest in that documentary. And he was just like, this is the end of good rap. All good rap ended after Tribe. And I'm like, don't fall into that trap. And he was just like, ain't no trap. Like, you guys don't listen to good music. And I was like, Ooh, that's not going to age well, sort of like the Lakers trade. But, like, I'm willing to take that hit. Like, I can't prove, like, Lil Wayne is better than, Il, like, Nas. But I, I think he is. Well, as far as I know, all rap started in 2003. With? Rick Ross and Jeezy. That's when <laughs> rap started. The oh NBA started in 1996. Like, Motivation 1 was crazy when it came out. That was the start of rap. It was Prior to that was, like, you know... The Knicks in 1956 throwing chess passes to each other <laughs> and hook shots. You know, rap began in earnest with Thug Motivation 101. Perhaps still it began with. Uh, we still sound like boomers there. Though. The mixtape, oh, dude. It's so long ago. It's <laughs> so long ago. I, I was thinking about this um, at pickup ball. Like the median age of the group you play with is reflected by generally what's played over the speakers uh-huh. or the what radio do you guys, or whatever. What do you guys slap glass to? Well, so I was playing at the... Is, is there any realm in which pickup ball is not mentioned at least once per episode? Got to... We all have our things. Like you I say have, baby. I say baby. You say Tom Cruise. He says pickup. We all got our things, baby. Yeah, you, met, you mentioned the movie about the singers. Oh, Bradley Cooper is always Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm curious, but it's the, the pickup ball thing is very, uh, very prevalent. Oh, I, we know. It's a basketball podcast. Called Cookies. Touching net. Oh, uh, yeah, there we go. The pickup basketball podcast. <laughs> I like our shtick. Jalen Rose has a shtick. And we're yeah, in our a... lane. Anyway. What yeah, was... yeah, yeah. The last time I played, they were playing Artifacts records from like wrong side of the tracks. And I was like, okay, this is an, this is an old man run. That was one <clears> of my like, favorite records. That was like 27-year-old records. records are getting dropped. Or whatever it was. That was an old school one. I like it. I like more like the dip set ones. You're like, okay, that's like adults. Yeah. Like older millennials, it's not official old man run. No, I saw I saw two girls who were maybe like sixteen years old walking down the street the other day in matching Strokes t shirts. Wow, which I thought was pretty vintage amazing. or new. Please say new. They were new. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. But the, but like the classic logo. Sure, they were both the exact same t shirt. Yeah. I was like, that's what's up. It's like Bourdain used to walk around his show with like a crispy Ramones beefy tee. Mm-hmm. I'm like the. I used to get mad, and I'm like, that's a good look. Ah, that Gildan Hammer. Yeah, yeah. Um, But yeah, I I watch all these shows about, I mean, people are talking about that show Euphoria on HBO, and uh, it just feels like kids felt, or like when we first saw um, Skins, remember that BBC show? Yeah. And everyone was scandalized by that, and I forget what music they were playing on Euphoria, but it wasn't, it didn't sound new, you know, like... It was definitely written and produced by people who were older. Yeah, but... Was it the artifacts? It was not Tame One <laughs> of the artifacts. It's shout, out to, shout out to New Jeru's. They were, they, they were um, fighting all the time. That's why they didn't really do anything right. Because they were kind of good. They were kind of good. I think they fought all the time. Or did one, was one of them sick? I don't know. It was a great era for East Coast duos. You had the Beat Nuts... You, yeah, mob, mob deep. deep. It's a good duet just, area. Just to, just to go back to Euphoria really quick, because the, the, your point is funny. It's just, you know, boomer shit. 
But it does. <laughs> I said it, guys. Yeah. I'm in the club. Um, no, but it did. It felt like it was written by somebody much older. It felt like uh, where kids was kind of like, yeah, this is just how shit Barry is. Barry Levinson's son. This. Oh, really? Sam this, Levinson. This, Sam Levinson. So Barry Levinson's old as fuck. So but it was makes adapted his son probably from an young as fuck. Irish show? I think it's an adapt- adaptation. Perhaps, but it felt, it, it felt very teen panic. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, oh, fuck, this is what they're doing. And they're all doing it. They're all doing poppers. They're all doing weird drugs. They're all like meeting up with like six year old dudes getting nailed in the butt. Like, Isn't this they- like Romeo and Juliet, but a zillion years later? Which wasn't a love story, according to Cookies. Or was? Did we get to the bottom of that? I don't know, but it sounds like we're about to hit Jordan's DiCaprio um, mandatory reference. I don't talk about Leo that much. To be fair to Jordan, I brought up Romeo and Juliet, but the book. Yes. The book, you know. (laughs) Drugs. Drugs. Teen teen suicide. Gangs. Extramarital sex. Gang shit. Gang Gang shit. shit. Gang, gang, gang. Shout out to Steven Spielberg remaking West Side Story. Real gang shit. But like in that period of time, not like updated. Oh, he's just remaking a, a 50s... Yeah, the costumes are like pleated pants tucked in, which like sounds like a new look, but it's like brown and khaki. Have you noticed that Joaquin Phoenix wears the same shirts in every single movie? Does he? Is that a thing? I just feel like every shirt he's wearing the same the color. Crumpled white shirts? Same color, exact same one. I mean, some people, the line, some people have that. The master, he's always just wearing the same shirt. I mean, Jason Statham is the king of everything but also the king of wearing the same thing in movies a black suit every time it's a black suit with a long black tie and if he's going casual it's blue jeans with a gray hoodie every movie except for the meg where of course he has to wear a, a wetsuit that has a long black tie with a, <laughs> as you do the gray yeah. hood <laughs> uh, which well, you saw in the theater yeah okay What's his name? Who was in Indiana Jones? That kid, uh, that weird kid. Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf went viral the other day because he wore like an old Hawaiian shirt that he wore like on the Disney Channel like twenty years ago, maybe. But he just like brought that out as a as a look. And like, was that was that a nod to Nick Nolte, who still owns and still rocks the Hawaiian shirt that he wore in that famous mug shop from like ninety four? It's one of the greatest images that um, modern photography has produced. Yeah, yeah, you can't get rid of that shirt. That's a good one. Um, Do you think Hugh Grant still owns that white and brown uh, striped polo that he cops that? Shout out to Hugh Grant who recently said that he shouldn't be cast in any more romantic comedies because he's too old. And I'm like, that's some that's I wouldn't predict that from a boomer. I think he'd be like, still got it. How old is Hugh Grant now? 60. 70, I don't know, 80. No. Is he no 90? Way. Is he 90 years old? Is he 100? Is he alive? I don't know. Yeah. He's definitely he's, alive. Kicks it at the standard. He's a poor man's Gerard Depardieu in my book. <laughs> oh, come on, Depardieu. man. You're, More do. You're, you're, you're veering into dangerous territory, getting on my man, Hugh Grant. <laughs> the funniest dude of all time. I had time. dinner with him once, and yeah. uh, by accident. Uh, he was sitting at a table Alone with... Alone, and I sat down next to him. <laughs> he was sitting at a table with an art collector, and they, were, we, they ushered us over, and we had sushi with them, and he was super, super nice. Like, this was kind of in his heyday, maybe like 15 years ago. Mm, about about a boy heyday. era. After About a Boy, I, I love that. Remember Badly Drawn Boy? Oh, hell yeah. I kind of like that. Who, Were we just taking a boomer slap? No, this is, this is uh, what is this? Yeah, Badly Drawn Boy is boomer, right? He had that weird, like, ski hat all the time. The tea cozy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was... Very good for that one to two albums, and then he made that soundtrack. It was a moment. It's kind of forgotten to time. Yeah, like we celebrate rightfully Oasis because Liam Gallagher is an amazing tweeter, but we don't celebrate Badly Drawn Boy. We barely talk about EMF. It's it's unbelievable. It's truly unbelievable. (laughs) Stop stop burdening me with your questions. (laughs) All right, so... um, Tell us more about the sushi that Hugh Grant um, ordered, because you are, you know, the a connoisseur of sushi. No, I don't know anything about sushi. I am but bad with sushi. That's true. I know everything about sushi. Thank you. Um, he ordered some boomer shit. It was like California rolls. Yeah, I was like, "What's this?" He was like, "I'll have the boomer." The boomer roll. (laughs) What would be in the boomer roll? Salmon cooked. Lawn clippings. Uh, 
<laughs> Air Monarch leather. <laughs> Pleats. But you just got to want to eat it more. <laughs> yeah. Gross. Oh, well, that was a pretty good show. <laughs> what else we got? Is that it? So are we, are we out of here? Did we finish up our, our, our Jalen chat? Did we? Did we come to a, a spot? Um, I, like pretty, I think we came pretty ones. close. Well, you got to... That's all we really do is we come pretty close. Near enough is good enough. Yeah. That kind of thing. But like, shout out to Jalen Rose because he's We're just playing doing with hand grenades thing. here, not not a uh, not blow darts. <laughs> Don't understand what that means at all. So continue, quote. <laughs> well, like shout out to these guys who just like have to do their thing because like this, it's hard to stay around, right? Which is the boomer ethos, kind of. Never leave, never die, just keep running. I built forever. this building that's going to be around for fifty years because also I can. not. Not to be cynical, but you know Jalen's got the inside track with all the players. So if he's out there repping the players hard, especially ex players, and they feel like he's in a circle, then he's going to keep getting those little nuggets of info. I mean, Ryan Hollis. he's our man. Jalen's position makes total sense for who he is. I'm just like, you know, former players are not very good announcers. They're not the best analysts. They're- Can we name a former player that is a good announcer? I can't, man. That's what I'm saying. They're not that good. Jeff Van Gundy. This kind of fits. You played in hot. It kind of fits into <laughs> me being irked that former players do get some of these jobs. I'm like, they're different. Jo- is what you're saying is they're different jobs entirely. Yeah, like Paul Pierce is kind of amusing because he plays himself because he admits his his I love poop Paul shenanigans. Pierce. It's great. Him and Michelle Beadle should have a show together. Yeah, they, they didn't get re-upped though, did they? No. I feel like they. Uh, I thought they were so great. I, think, I feel like they left let their their contracts slide. Beatles had a tough time because she was going to be a star on ESPN, and like they keep on shifting her role. She was on Sports Nation with Max Kellerman, and um, I forget the football player, but and they moved her to the NBA. And I thought she was great this year, man. It was even better than TNT. I mean, can we just get rid of Mark Jackson and just put Doris in there? That's the everyone. I mean, this is like the Keanu Reeves thing. Like, the, everyone wants that to happen. What is the deal with Mark Jackson? Being there though, I don't get it. He's not good. I, I think he's he's yeah. he's so surly and bitter and just wrong about shit. He sucks. He calls for a team to run the high pick and roll at least twice a game, and which is why he got fired from Golden State because all he did was run the high pick and roll. But he's also not amusing or joyful. He had a he's, moment. He's, he's he had dull. a moment. Yeah, he's dour as shit. But he had he's a on moment, a mission right? From Gad. Like hand down, man down, um, mama. There goes that man. Like, but they're terrible. He, yeah, now they're terrible. But that's been ten years. You know, like so. I can see what I think. I agree. I think the execs should probably do a switcheroo. Yo, the Van Gundys are crushing it. Jeff Van Gundy is good, man. He's good, but uh, David Roth had wrote a thing about Mark Jackson. I thought was pretty good, and he even made the point that he's kind of turned Van Gundy into a bit of a cartoon. That Mark Jackson's but this is the has kind of played into that. But this is what you need to do, right? Like the era of Bob Costas and Marv Albert are kind of over. And like, I think you have a tenure as a caricature of yourself for like, if you're lucky, like Mark Jackson and Van Gundy, but that's just what it is now. Sort of like how things have changed metrically. This is just what announcing is. We need some fresh blood. Fresh blood. Need some, need some, a young person in there. Like, oh, that's a... Is it that's a preteens rebound. Out there looking like that's, a fam. Yeah. That's a that's a that's a young boy's rebound. But that's what I don't get, right? Someone along the line said, Reggie Miller, you're well known. You had that whole thing with John Starks, and you're a character and you talked a lot of shit. You're gonna be an announcer. It's a hard job, man. But it's a really hard job. Yeah. And he wasn't good at it. And he he still isn't good at it. But he's now been an announcer for many years. Chris Weber, engaging personality, smart dude. Everyone loves Chris Weber, not a good announcer. But here he is, probably like, like his Jefferson. seventh year of being an announcer. And that's the guys we get, former players who are known for having a personality. But I'm guessing there are guys who might be awesome announcers who are former players I want that them, we don't get to see because they don't have that, the name. I want them to give Tim Duncan a shot. That voice calling games, too funny. Or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He might be great. One of knows? those two dudes. Well, Jabbar funny. just shitting on everyone the entire time. It's funny you bring up Kareem because, like, we should have brought him up 
20 minutes ago, Kareem and Ewing never got the chance to like be in management and they were just like priming themselves this whole time and they never got the chance. Yeah, I totally get Rose's point about former players deserving that shot. I'm just kind of like, well, former players, what they're good at is playing basketball and I think a lot of them could be GMs and they don't get that opportunity. But I also think the issue is one of making sure that these organizations top to bottom are diverse and not necessarily just filled with former players. Make sure your interns, make sure your scouting department, make sure your assistant coaches are diverse as the league. Don't just be like, it's a, you know, a a post playing career destination to just litter your organization with former players and have Starks and Alan Houston and John Wallace and Larry Johnson just all up in your organization. And reading the room is a skill, and an uh, organization like the Knicks don't read the room. And you're right about Doris Book, Burke. Everyone wants her in there, put her in there. She, she'd be great, and people would watch because of her and talk about her. So that's automatic. And, like, read the room, like, metrics. Like, that's a skill that not many organizations or companies have, right? Because they'll just put Mark Jackson back up there. Well, we... We talk about it too much to even get into it now, but the Knicks make decisions because they're the Knicks. And the NBA makes this, ABC makes decisions because they're ABC. But you look at a team like the Timberwolves now trying to shop Wiggins when, when they had the opportunity to trade him two Breaking years ago. Andrew Wiggins made they, available. <laughs> they easily could have traded him two years ago before putting themselves in this predicament and or gotten him a walk good Before call. looking him in the eyes and giving him... Two hundred and twenty million dollars. Look I'm, into my boomer eyes. Do you want it or not? <laughs> <laughs> it was literally the most boomer shit ever. <laughs> yeah. Look, look into my gauzy, <laughs> squinting, wrinkly eyes and tell me that you're going to get better at defense. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm, okay, here's your yeah. money. <laughs> twenty nine, thirty million. <laughs> I looked at him and I knew he wasn't lying. He was going to become a better passer. <laughs> oh, Andrew. Not well, you. we promise you that even though this pod was perfect, look into our squinty eyes and we will tell you that next week... We'll make it more perfect. We promise. More perfect than the last. I love cookies. 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 I love cookies.